welcome everybody, friends, antiquaries, fellows, guests. Thank you very much for coming in on this talk, which for me is the summation of, of a career that goes back to 1973 when I first joined the staff of the National Museum and took an interest in the material culture of Scotland. My title for this talk though says that I'm still searching for a national identity and I don't think at the end of this talk you will have a complete impression or understanding of what that national identity is but I hope very much that you will be able to agree with me that it is an interesting subject and one that's deserving much more attention. So we are very fortunate in having uh, a national museum in Scotland, the roots of which go right back to the foundation of our society in 1780. And generations of curators have systematically collected the material culture of Scotland so that we have an incredible resource to study to help us understand how our ancestors lived and what they believed. Our founder, Lord Buchan, gave us a uh, objects right from the very beginning of the society, including this uh, remarkable guidon of the Regiment of Dragoons, which was founded by his ancestor in 1689. And our early fellows were, were very good at uh, building up this collection, and it's always been one of the main threads in the development of our antiquarian interests. Other great uh, antiquaries of the 19th century, like Sir Daniel Wilson, were very instrumental not only in having the idea to publish the proceedings with uh, lots of learned research, but in cataloguing and systemising the, the collection so that it was available for other people in the future to study. And in the course of the, the years, the collection has been an incredible resource from which to do exhibitions about Scotland and its past. And in the uh, 1990s, I and my fellow curators in the National Museums had the privilege of working, helping to put together the displays in Scotland, which are in the Museum of Scotland in Chamber Street. And when we were doing that, uh, there was a, a fair amount of debate as to what the nature of Scottish identity was and its material culture. One of the themes that very much permeates the displays is that Scotland was part of Europe and uh, a lot of our material culture is part of a, a larger collection of understandably European material culture. There was a perception that from the 12th century we very deliberately as a country, as a nation, uh, aligned ourselves with what was happening elsewhere in Europe in accepting forms of government, having forms of economy, um, developing a, a money system, adopting a patron saint, uh, St Andrew from the Mediterranean, and very much looking like we were part of a, of a wider Europe, as indeed we were. So our ancestors were very conscious that not only were we part of a, a wider European heritage and culture, but that we had our own stretching back to the past, sometimes called Celtic. Though don't ask me to define exactly what I mean by that. But I would suggest to you, you can see it in things like the, the fantastic tradition of sculpture in the West Highlands, including wonderful crosses like this one at Campbelltown, which is 14th century in date, and the decoration is manifestly medieval. But the idea of having a cross like that, I think shows some awareness of the great tradition of high crosses and other crosses in that part of the world, extending back to the, the ninth century. And other objects like uh, the Coigrich of St. Philan, a crozier shrine commemorating an early saint from Perthshire. Although in its present form, it dates to the late 15th century, it actually incorporates a lot of decoration from earlier crozier shrines and from the original crozier itself. And beyond that, of course, there is a question to what extent our art and culture is English. 
It's a subject area which sometimes we've been rather cagey about or, or wish to avoid as Scots. Well, we're different from the English. That's what all this is about. But it is obviously the case that a lot of the material culture that was in use in Scotland and uh, the, the items that we made for ourselves are very similar to items from England. Here's an easy example here, uh, a seal from, belonging to Inchaffrey Abbey in Perthshire dating to the 14th century and it's very similar to a contemporary seal that was made for the town of Kings Lynn in England. So the obvious conclusion is that the Inchaffrey seal is English work like lots of other things and so what which were imported for use. However we should be wary of always going down that road. It can sometimes be the other way around that it's Scottish things that have gone to England and we should always look out for that. And then we have things like the, this remarkable large bronze lectern from Holyrood Abbey, which I think is fairly clearly English work. And I think we sometimes forget that we had a lot more dealings with the English than just from two sides of a field where we were fighting each other. Something which I think that uh, is one of the major things that, that we probably need to research as we, as we go on. And there are a lot of other challenges. Uh, and that's what makes this subject matter so interesting. One of them, I would suggest, has been our lack of uh, ability, uh, our lack of knowledge to identify women in the past in, an archaeologic, in archaeological terms. There's practically no artefacts which I'm aware of from uh, medieval archaeological sites where we can say, yep, that belonged to a woman. They're, they're, they're rather um, unusual. Um, and when we do have items associated with women, it tends to be very famous women and very important objects, like notably the Queen Mary harp here, a splendid medieval harp from the, the West Highlands. And unfortunately, the association with Mary Queen of Scots is rather obscured what I think is very much more interesting, that it belonged to a family in Perthshire, the Robertsons of Lud, who are very keen on, on keeping alive the tradition of harp playing. The, the portrait alongside um, the hen wife of Grant is one of the earliest illustrations, I think, of a peasant woman, somebody of, of no great consequence from Scotland, uh, dating to the uh, early 18th century. A remarkable painting, I think, of, of great importance. But in archaeological terms, um, one might find the, find the brooch she's wearing. And we have traditionally seen brooches like that as being worn by women, though I doubt if that is the, the total story. On the other hand, the thing that she's most interested in, her snuff mull and spoon, if we found those, we would almost inevitably uh, think, oh, well, this is a man taking snuff. All I'm trying to say is that uh, we have to try harder uh, on this front and be aware that there is a great challenge. There is also a great challenge for us that so much of our important heritage has been destroyed or gone missing, particularly material re relating to the church, where because of uh, changes in, in, in church organisation and beliefs, we deliberately destroyed a lot of it. But thanks to the work of very considerable scholars like the late one senior David McRoberts, we have managed to find uh, some objects of importance, like this splendid banner from St Giles in Edinburgh, probably dating to 1521, and lots of evidence of, of what is now missing, things which have been destroyed. One of the few things, incidentally, which I think have remained in use from medieval times, despite changes in the church, has been a very interesting series of bells, like this one dating to the, the 1480s, which belonged in a church in Dundonald. But one of the things which I find most fascinating uh, about this area of research is looking at the actual objects in detail. And it's my belief that one can and should expect to learn a great deal from looking at the objects in the same way as you, as you read a book or a document. And I just want to give you briefly two examples of, of that. Uh, this sea chest, which belonged to Alexander Selkirk, the uh, man who was marooned on a South Pacific island in 1704 and was the model basically for Robinson Crusoe. Thanks to the research of my colleague in the museum, Stephen Jackson, uh, we now know that this is a particular type of uh, chest which comes from 
the north of Italy. And why is that of interest? Well, because I think it gives us a, an insight into what Selkirk was doing immediately prior to going on his expedition to the South Pacific in 1703. The captain of the ship he was on, Charles Pickering, had uh, made a bad name for himself in the Mediterranean and was being hounded by various political authorities. And that's one of the main reasons why he was quite keen to get well away from the Mediterranean. And the fact that Selkirk has a chest which comes from fairly near the port of Livorno, where Charles Pickering was based at the very beginning of the 18th century, I think is a fairly clear indication that Selkirk did have some past in this world of piracy and privateering in the Mediterranean before he ended up in the South Pacific. Another uh, example which uh, turned up fairly recently, uh, found by metal detector um, in Fife, is a seal matrix of uh, a notable churchman, William Lamberton, who was Bishop of St Andrews in the early 14th century. And we've rather forgotten about how important Lamberton was as a great Scottish patriot, um, a supporter of Robert Bruce, uh, a man who was uh, one of the leaders of the Scottish community at various times and did much to help with, with getting our independence. But when we have a look at this seal and others that uh, have, have survived uh, for him, we see some rather curious things. It describes him as Bishop of St Andrews, which is a new development. Previous bishops of St Andrews described themselves as bishops of the Scots, which sounds rather more prestigious. The seal has a, has a design of a cell tire in it for St Andrews, but it also has incorporated in it images of a bird and a fish. And I believe that nobody with any education in Scotland in the early 14th century would have doubted that those symbols represented Glasgow, where Lamberton had been Chancellor at the, uh, at the cathedral. So here we have the seal of a very important uh, individual, the leader of the Scottish Church, um, with a change of title which sounds less prestigious and symbolism for Glasgow. There's a story there somewhere. I can't tell you what it is, but I hope very much somebody will look uh, more into it. A lot of objects have survived because um, they have actually been assumed or associated with, with events. They've been given some sort of uh, relevance. And uh, here's an example which um, I think is, 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 is quite interesting. It's a cannon, a bronze cannon, which sits outside Inverary Castle. And like so many guns in Scotland, it's been assumed to be from an Armada wreck, in this case from the Spanish ship that went down in Tobermory. Any gun in Scotland, most guns, get, get, that's what they say, they're from the Armada. And that's certainly what uh, the Campbells believed in the late 19th century. But there were other stories about this gun beforehand. In the early 19th century, um, the Dukes of Argyll told distinguished visitors that this was a gun which had come from the Battle of Pavia in the north of Italy in 1524. And, you know, that may not be very far off the mark. The gun is, is, a, is a splendid example of French gun casting. It's got symbolism on it relating it to King Francis I. And I think that it may well have come in a batch of guns to Scotland brought here by our governor at the time, uh, John Duke of Albany. Now, the Duke of Albany was actually one of the main commanders on the French expedition uh, into Italy in 1524 that resulted in the Battle of Pavia. He was a very distinguished international soldier. However, the gun I think we can trace coming to Scotland the year before that, in a batch of guns that came here in 1523. We can then trace it being used by the Campbells, who seem to have acquired it in the 1540s, by the way, being used by them in various other sieges and events in Scotland, not least uh, the Siege of Edinburgh Castle in 1573. And I find 
that often the real story behind these objects rather than what people think can be very much more interesting. And of course it's very easy to assume that guns uh, came from a nomadic ship. Other objects we have turned into national treasures and there's nothing wrong with having national treasures. That's a great thing to do. But sometimes we don't altogether necessarily get that right. An example which uh, I find very interesting is this splendid little house shrine which is on display in the Museum of Scotland, which our, our great um, Joseph Anderson, one of our uh, fellows in the 19th century, uh, identified as being a very important uh, early church relic, but also he thought it might be a lost shrine, a lost, uh, a lost vexillum, we'll come back to that word in, in a moment, a lost vexillum associated with St Columba. Um, which he wrote up as being a very important relic, if you like, that was taken uh, on campaign by Scottish armies and uh, was presumably on various uh, battlefields. And his reason for making this identification was that this house shrine first came to the attention of antiquaries when it was rediscovered at Monimusk in uh, the middle of the 19th century and Anderson knew that in the early 14th century um, a man called Monny Musk uh, was the keeper of the shrine called of the Vexillum, he was the keeper of the Vexillum called the Breck Berwick and Anderson put two and two together and made at least five in my opinion. The Monny Musk reliquary is very important, we should be very proud of it but I think the evidence that it is actually um, a famous battle uh, standard of the Scots is probably lacking. Unfortunately, it's probably going to take a very long time to actually get this story out of system. You can see that the, it features on uh, some of our banknotes, if you're rich enough ever to have seen a £20 note, and it's recently been shown round the neck of the uh, Abbot of Arbroath in this monument. Uh, celebrating the declaration of our growth in 1320. Let's be clear about this. Um, a vexillum was primarily a standard and uh, maybe that's what the Breck Benech was, a flag. And there's no evidence that it had national importance. The documentation that survives about it seems to show that it was a requirement for whoever was the keeper of the Breck Benech to lead out the tenants of the Abbey of Arbroath with it. That is not national. There is no mention of the Breck Benach in early documents about uh, Bannockburn or any other battle. Um, what I suppose I, I, I think about all this is, it's a great story, but what we should always be very careful to do is uh, always ask questions. Never assume that just because it was great scholars like Joseph Anderson who said something that we shouldn't actually go back and think, well, why did he say that? Is there another way of looking at things? And I hope very much that some of you will think that is a good thing to do. Another object uh, I would draw to your attention in this general area is um, this stone, which you, is probably very well known to you. Um, and it's the Stone of Schoon, the Stone of Destiny in Edinburgh Castle. It's possible that uh, this goes back to the late 9th century uh, and it seems to have been involved from the very beginning with the creation of kings. Whatever the reason was for picking this stone or reusing it in the late 9th century, if it is indeed that old, has been lost in the mists of time because it's been replaced by other stories which we required for political reasons. In 1296, that stone was sitting in a chair in the uh, church, in the Abbey Church at Schoon. And Edward I of England had just uh, humiliated us Scots in, in a decisive battle at Dunbar and he'd been all round Scotland and received submissions from all of our Scots. He had conquered Scotland. There was no sign of resistance. Uh, there was no indication that, uh, that the future would be any different from Scotland becoming part of England. And Edward was looking around for some sort of souvenir, I think, to celebrate this wonderful 
victory and he lighted on the stone which he thought could probably serve a similar function in the chapel he was having built to Edward the Confessor in Westminster Abbey, used in a similar way to this stone, the way it was being used in Schoon Abbey, probably as part of the seat for the officiating clergies. So you had the stone removed and it was taken down to England. It was, yes, it was associated with the, the creation of Scottish kings. And what we see uh, from 1296, 1296 into the early years of the 14th century is the stone is central to a great political argument between the Scots and the English. The English are claiming a right to control and own the whole of Scotland on the basis that this island is the island of Britain and that was clearly named after Brutus who was the ancestor of the Scottish kings so therefore Scotland should be part of, um, part of England by right. The Scots on the other hand had a rather different story and this involved the understanding that our ancestor was Scota, the daughter of the pharaoh of Egypt, who married a son of the, the king of Athens, uh, this son being the ancestor of, of, of the Gaels. And they brought the stone with them from Egypt. It was a throne. It was a seat uh, that, that king sat on. And eventually it uh, ended up in Scotland uh, and was part of the ceremony for um, making kings as good as indeed it was. But these um, conflicting arguments uh, were all about trying to convince um, the Pope for why he should support the cause of Scotland, the cause of Robert Bruce to be recognised as king. Because it's only the Popes that could give the right for kings to undergo coronation rites and to be anointed. And the symbolism of those um, ceremonies was that it indicated that the kings in question owed no allegiance to any earthly man or any earthly king. They only owed allegiance to God. And that's what the Scots wanted. They didn't want to go down the road that the English were developing of uh, saying that the stone was um, the pillow on which Jacob had rested his head in the desert, a story recounted in the Bible. This was an argument the Scots won. And the first Scottish king who was actually crowned in, in a real sense was David II in 1329. The stone was still in England. It remained in England until uh, not so very many uh, years ago. But the interesting thing it seems to me about it is that we Scots showed absolutely no interest in getting it back. It was irrelevant to us. It was something that dated to a past that, uh, that was inappropriate. We had the right to have our own crowned kings and it didn't matter what lump of rock uh, the English had. James VI took no interest in it when he became a king of England in 1603. It only became of interest again in 1950 when uh, a group of students stole it from Westminster Abbey and brought it back to Scotland. I do wonder actually if uh, Robert Bruce would be rather embarrassed by that but uh, We'll probably never find that one out. The um, other, uh, th there's lots of other uh, fascinating stories about uh, objects and national treasures. Um, and um, one other that uh, I want to draw to your attention is uh, Mons Meg, very well known to you, the big gun in Edinburgh Castle. And again, it seems to me an example of where we've got the importance of it or the story behind it wrong. It was made in Mons, incidentally, in 1449, and it was given as a gift uh, to us by the Duke of Burgundy in 1457 and spent a lot of its life in Edinburgh Castle. When it was given to us, it was probably already defunct technology. Uh, we believe it was used at the siege of Norham, castle in uh, 1497 where it failed to knock the castle down incidentally and it probably saw very little other active use apart from and I think this has been largely forgotten apart from in 1540 when Mons was taken on the royal expedition under James V 
to don the Western Isles. And Mons was presumably uh, put on the front of uh, James V's uh, flagship, the Salamander, shown there after uh, she turned English, and was sailed into various ports in the west of Scotland. Can you imagine the impression this made? The Royal Expedition with this muckle gun peering over the bows of the, of the Scottish ships as they sailed into Portree or Tobermory or wherever else. That was a real uh, main event, it seems to me, in Mon's life and quite an, uh, quite made, a, made a major impression. The carriage she's on, incidentally, is, is a reproduction of that one shown in an early carving at Edinburgh Castle, and the accounts for the, the, the building of that survive. It was made for putting her on shipboard in 1540. The reason why we've kept a lot of uh, the, the material culture that we have is because we have associated it with, uh, with famous people. Uh, and famous uh, events. And uh, again, uh, sometimes the, the, the stories which, for me anyway, are most interesting are the ones where we've manifestly got the story wrong. And that certainly applies to this rather remarkable cup which is preserved at uh, Dunvegan Castle in Skye uh, with the, the MacLeods. So Walter Scott, uh, who saw it, um, in the 19th century, wanted to associate it with the uh, with Summerled, uh, the king of the Isles, great uh, local prince, um, who was a, an ancestor of various uh, West Highland clans. And the MacLeods themselves had traditions taking it back to events in the 13th century. But there are two things very obvious about this cup, I would say to you, is it's very obviously an Irish nether type of cup that was often used for measuring out supplies. Like, for instance, when you employed uh, mercenaries in warfare, you would maybe undertake to give them methods full of butter or oats or whatever it happened to be. So not only is it, is it Irish, it seems to me, in, in form and decoration, it has an inscription on it which indicates that it was made for Catherine uh, O'Neill, who was wife of John Maguire. Uh, of, Ferman of Fermanagh in Northern Ireland. And I think this is a fairly strong indication that this cup was acquired in the north of Ireland in the 1590s when the MacLeods of Harris, the MacLeods of Dunvegan, were involved in fighting there. You know, it's one of the, the main events in clan history, it seems to me, uh, which they seem to have largely ignored or forgotten about. But in 1594, uh, the MacLeods of Harris went to help the Maguires in the, the siege of Enniskillen Castle. And um, in the following year, they, they went back and were involved in some of the major fighting in Ireland on the, the, the side of the northern, uh, on the side of the Irish Earls, the Earl of Tyrone and uh, probably played a significant part in the Battle of uh, uh, Clantibret uh, in that year. Uh, and it seems to me a shame that, uh, that that story has been forgotten. It's one that probably would pay uh, more attention. Uh, as a curator, of course, I'm, I'm used to the idea that uh, objects acquire associations, which are not necessarily true. Um, the lot of a curator is to see many objects which are associated with Mary Queen of Scots or William Wallace and sometimes, well often actually, you know that they're, they're the wrong type of thing or the, or the wrong date. And this I think is a, is a particularly um, instructive one. It's the large sword which is displayed in the uh, Wallace Monument uh, outside Stirling. When the Wallace Monument was being built in the 19th century, there was a great desire to find appropriate relics to go with the great man, and they were very hard to find. Uh, Charles Rogers, the main man, was aware that there was this sword in Dumbarton Castle, which had already been uh, uh, rubbished by the experts of the day, quite rightly, as being uh, a not very good example of a 16th century two-handed sword absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with Wallace himself. But uh, Rogers was desperate. 
he badly needed some symbol. And eventually he managed to persuade himself that somehow or another uh, this could be associated with the great man. And in a way, I mean, it's quite appropriate. It's a business-like weapon. It's, and for a man who is seen as, as, as a leader of the people, it's not a particularly fancy or sophisticated looking weapon. So in some ways, it's been quite uh, an appropriate um, thing to have. Incidentally, its uh, association with uh, Wallace um, only goes back to 1803 and um, I'm very grateful to uh, my colleague Bob Savage for originally pointing this out to me, that prior to 1803, this sword is only mentioned, I think, in one inventory as an old, rusty, two-handed sword. End of story. But in 1803, uh, a couple from England knocked on the door uh, of the castle, William Wordsworth and his sister, sister Dorothy, and asked that they could be shown around. And um, one of the soldiers took them into the guard room and basically said, well, missus, see that sword up there? It belonged to Willie Wallace, our great hero. And Dorothy Wordsworth wrote that into her diary. And that is the basis for the identification of it being Wallace's sword. However, that's not necessarily the end of the story because one of the most remarkable things about the sword, it seems to me, is that the blade is actually made of three pieces welded together. And it's just possible that one of these, the parts of one of these blades is in fact part of a 13th century sword blade. So maybe yet, maybe yet, we can turn it into something uh, associated with, the, with, our, with our great hero. Uh, it's still good under any circumstances to have something that we, we, we can focus on. For many people, uh, the keeping of, of relics was about uh, showing how, how big they were, how important their, their ancestors were. And uh, a very clear example of that is what we call the, 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 the Butte Mazer, a big communal drinking cup, which was uh, kept by the, um, a, a family of minor lairds, the Bannatines of Kames in Butte. And the Ninian uh, uh, Bannatine probably had this uh, Mazer uh, built, made in 1522. And uh, my colleague uh, George Dalgrish in the museum, of course, has been very instrumental in doing a lot of the, the research on this. But remarkably, the cup incorporates in it uh, that silver gilt print, which uh, I show there, uh, a line, I think representing Robert the Bruce, surrounded by the shields of some of his leading nobles in the immediate aftermath of Bannockburn. I think that it shows the sophistication of Scottish court life and ability of Scottish craftsmen at that period to make uh, silver gilt and enamelled um, objects. And this is a very rare survival. Um, and Ninian Bannatyne has kept it, the, the, the Bannatynes have kept it in their family because they've understood that in some ways uh, one of these people here uh, was one of their ancestors. Another example of this is this uh, sword which uh, the National Museums purchased not so very many years ago. It's, it's clearly uh, a sword which dates to 1822 and uh, was carried in processions in that year when uh, George IV visited Scotland. And there's no doubt that the sword dates to that period. The, the picture there shows Sir Evan MacGregor uh, wearing the sword when he and his clan accompanied the Crown Jewels of Scotland during one of the uh, processions from the, between the castle and Holyrood Palace during the royal visit. The MacGregors, of course, had been a, a, a totally reviled family. They, they, they were seen by government uh, circles as so horrid that they weren't even allowed to use their own name. And in some ways, this was an opportunity for the MacGregors to reclaim their heritage and to be seen in a better light. The sword indicates in the form of inscriptions that incorporated in it are a sword, a two-handed sword, which was carried by a clan ancestor in a battle at Glenfruin in 1615. 
and also the sword that was carried by the ancestor who was um, at the battle, uh, who was out in the 1745 and who was the Edicom of Prince Charles. And a detailed study of the sword actually indicates to me that both stories could well be true. It's clearly important for the McGregors to establish these credentials and have them accepted as being um, appropriate for the, for the period. Being a Jacobite uh, was obviously a, a group identity thing. It was, it was something, it was a, a, a tradition, a club if you like, a political background that people could identify with. And as, as a result of the royal visit uh, became acceptable. But there are other examples of how Scots use material culture to demonstrate their affiliations and their interests. And for me, a, a good example of that are the, is the incredible collection of medieval sculpture in churches and other places in the Western Isles and in Argyll. Many of them showing uh, weapons or military figures like this group, which I've, I've pulled out here. And you'll notice, incidentally, that uh, some of these figures, and indeed a lot of the effigies, show these warriors putting on uh, their own swords, which is a rather unusual bit of symbolism, though um, I'm grateful to Philip Bennett, one of our uh, fellows, for suggesting to me that this is almost a sort of these guys sort of saying, well, we are knighting ourselves. You know, we are part of this warrior caste because they were, they were a warrior caste. The Western Isles in the medieval period was a very militarised society which produced warriors to go and do the fighting in places like Ireland and elsewhere in Scotland. And a lot of these warriors seem to have invested their, their money and their effort into providing these images for posterity. Um, other groups of Scots uh, had other ways of, of showing group identity. And I show you here uh, three daggers, fine quality, which were made by craftsmen, cutlers in Edinburgh and Canongate in the late 16th and early 17th century. And daggers, they, by the way, the language there, bollocks, they were called bollock knives, Not, don't need to go into why, um, or they were called dudgeon daggers or wingers. They seem to be very much admired by other people, including the English. These were the sort of things which uh, toffs, well-dressed gentlemen wore with uh, civilian clothing, like these uh, early 17th century images I pulled out there. They were boys' toys. You know, if you went out, you know, to go down the high street of Edinburgh, uh, you needed one of these. And another example uh, of this sort of group identity are the remarkable pistols, which were made in centres like Dundee and Edinburgh, also in the late 15th and early 16th century. And one of the reasons why we know so much about them and we've identified them is thanks to the work of Charles Whitelaw, a vice president of our society, he died in 1939, who left to the museum, the National Museum, one of the biggest legacies uh, it's ever had, plus a lot of information uh, on weapons. Now, practically none of these pistols, which are very high quality, survived in Scotland. We only know about them because they were very much admired by royalty and leaders elsewhere. Uh, they ended up in royal collections in places like Madrid, Paris, Dresden, Russia, Scandinavian countries, all across Europe. That pair I'm showing there, which I think were made by James Lowe in Dundee, 1611, belonged to Louis XIII of France. And I think that uh, a lot of them obviously went directly to these royal and princely owners as presents. But I think also it probably is an indication of the strength and importance of the movement of Scots mercenaries to take part in the, the wars in Europe in the late um, 16th and 17th century and is another remarkable part of our heritage. I'm sure they were worn and used in, in, in Scotland, incidentally. You'll notice some characteristics of them. They don't have trigger guards. They have um, hooks in the back so you can shove them down, the, down your belt or, or wear them on, on your person. And I have this image of some of our ancestors 
strutting down the high street of Edinburgh with these pistols and pulling them as necessary in rather the same way as Holly Hollywood has created this image of the Wild West with guys, you know, dueling in the street. There was even a case um, in the, the very end of the 16th century where one of the uh, Baileys of Edinburgh um, had to go and, and deal with um, a, a riot in the high school amongst the, the schoolboys, uh, Bailey McMoran, in 1598. And he was actually shot by one of the schoolboys uh, with a pistol. That's how, how bad it was. But an area we should be very, very proud of, it seems to me. And I want to end up in this uh, rather lightning and uh, patchy talk, just looking again at our national uh, dress. And here I've benefited so much from my colleagues like Hugh Cheap, who have done so much looking at the origins of, uh, of dress and tartan. And you see there are various uh, words which have been used uh, to describe it uh, over the years. And one of the things which I think is, is so striking about it is the way that it, it is so internationally acceptable and distinguished that uh, none of us should have any problem with uh, wearing Highland dress, Scottish national dress, in significant fora anywhere in the world. It's, uh, a dis it would be a distinguished uh, thing to do. I think sometimes we rather think of it as being Victorian, the way it developed. But an important point to get across is that it really does have its roots in the past. The accessories, the dirks, the bagpipes, the brooches, the sporins, are all medieval in form. And in the case of the dirks, these uh, daggers, the, the National Museum has a collection where you could put the collection in a long row, starting with a medieval knife, and just about have a dirk for every decade right up to present times. It's a living and continuous uh, tradition, which I think is, is quite remarkable. As for the dress itself, what are we talking about here? Well, it's a big, big subject, but what we're basically talking about here are plaids, the big woolly blankets, uh, normally with a tartan pattern, which people wound round their body. And one of the main things about a plaid, incidentally, is that it was probably enough to stop you dying from hypothermia if you were caught out in the Scottish countryside at any time of the year. And that's one of the reasons why I think they were so successful. There is evidence of plaids in that, that, that sort of sense being worn in Scotland in the medieval period. This, I think, is probably the earliest known authentic example. It's from a 15th century manuscript showing the royal poet appearing at the coronation of, at the, appearing at the inauguration rather, of King Alexander III in 1249. And he's wearing rather sophisticated clothing, he's well dressed, but he has this plaid wound round his body, which was probably originally crimson, and he's reciting the genealogy of the kings all the way back to Scota and the kings of Athens and, and so on. What we don't know is to what extent plaids were generally being worn in the medieval period. And I do wonder if, in fact, they were sometimes a badge of office, they were very expensive, and maybe they weren't uh, generally worn. But something happened in the uh, 16th century where plaids, the technology for making them, the, 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 the growing of the sheep where the wool came from, uh, became very much more available. And I think that one of the significant events was a meeting that took place at Ardrossan Castle in 1546, when remarkably the Privy Council of Scotland met there to sort out one bit of business in particular. And that was a reconciliation between the Campbells, the Earl of Argyll, and the Macdonalds, uh, Macdonalds of Clan Edenvor, Clan Donald South. Um, who had been friends in the past, uh, but there was a, a reconciliation uh, took place. And as a result of that, we then find that uh, both sides, especially McDonald's, participating quite fully in the affairs of Scotland in a way that perhaps they hadn't done. And I think this can be tied down 
to this meeting stage managed by the Scottish Governor, the Earl of Arm, in 1546. Now, until the 1540s, we have the, uh, lots of images of warriors, MacDonalds and others from this part of the world, like the one I show here of Donald McGlesby at Finlagan and Isla. And there he is wearing, looking a bit like a, a, a large-scale version of the Lewis Chessman warriors. He's wearing a, 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 an Akaton, a quilted jacket, he's got mail, he's got a helmet on, and he's strapping on a big sword. But about the same period, when we find the McDonald's and the Campbells marching off to take part in national events, all of a sudden we get references to them wearing a different form of clothing. What we get actually is the first evidence and specifically, I'm talking here about a French source uh, looking at the Scots who took part in the Siege of Haddington in 1548, where there's a description which clearly indicates that a lot of these Macdonalds and Campbells were wearing plaids, and what's more, going into battle to the sound of bagpipes. This is the earliest evidence we've got of that particular Scottish thing, the Scottish warrior, the bagpipes, the tartan. And I think that it could well date to the 1540s. Frankly, it's difficult to identify plates at an earlier date because there doesn't seem to have been a word used in Latin sources which meant played and nothing else. But I think there's a lot of research that can be done in, on, on this. But, uh, and I hope there'll be people in my audience now who'll think, well, either will think I'm either talking nonsense or there's something here that is worthy of much more exploration. But certainly it seems to me from the 1540s we find the Highland warrior, the kilted, the, well not the kilt, but the, the plated, uh, tartan clad, bagpipe playing Scottish warrior emerging onto battlefields, not just in Scotland but uh, forming part of armies uh, on the continent as well, like this image of Mackay's regiment at Stettin in Poland in 1631. And what's remarkable, uh, and we don't have time to say uh, all that much more about it right now, what's remarkable is that it wasn't just about all well, providing uh, a basic form of clothing for the people at the bottom end of society. What we find is that all elements in society, also women as well, I might add, but adopted plaids. Here we see some, uh, some gentlemen, some nobles uh, of the early 18th century, leaders of Scottish society, Lords Enzi, Buchan and Marr. And there we have images of all of them as they wished to be seen in their best clothing. And in 1618, they entertained John Taylor, an Englishman from London, who probably to some extent was an English spy and they would have known it. And they took him on a hunting expedition to the Braes of Mar and they all got out of their, their normal togs and insisted that they should all get dressed up in tartan and plaids because that was the appropriate thing to do. And uh, what Taylor actually says is that they all had to be in one habit as if Lycurgus, who was a traditional king of Sparta way back, had been there and made laws of equality. So part of the, part of the game uh, it, that's developing, which I think is quite interesting, is, is to claim that this form of dress was not something which belonged to one strata in society. It was appropriate in some circumstances for the, the great and the good, as well as the people at the lower end of society, to wear it. And of course, what we, we, we then find as time goes on is that the, the people who were really uh, wanted to, to cut a dash to be seen as important in Scottish society, this is what they did. They got dressed up in, in tartan. Um, that's how you got your portrait done. The, the picture of uh, William Gordon of Fife shown there in the ruins of Rome, I think it's quite interesting because there's clearly an attempt to make his, his plaid look rather like a, a Roman uh, toga. And uh, there are other examples of that sort of phenomenon. However you, you look at uh, Highland dress, however you look at the things uh, I've said just now, 
it seems to me that uh, we have a fascinating heritage, a fascinating story. There's so much more uh, to be done and that's what I'm trying to get across. I hope to at least some of you uh, welcome, you know, have a look at all this and see what else you can do. It is so much of who we are and our traditions. Go out there and ask questions. And one final thing uh, I would like to say as my term of office as president of the society comes to an end. I've been very fortunate in having splendid staff uh, to keep me right and uh, good members of, of council uh, to also come up with uh, incredibly good ideas. But one of the things which I'm particularly proud of that the society has just about done, which I hope you will agree with in the next few days, is that we've got a tartan for ourselves. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to wearing something tartan for the society, discreetly of course, and I hope very much you people will join me in that. Thank you very much.